Hello and welcome to the Pots and Trials podcast with me, Martin, joined by Jill and Sean. Hello, hiya. Hi. And I'm really excited because today we're going to talk to Mark Vasileski, who is a manager on the Royal Parks in London. That's the Royal Parks, as in outside Buckingham Palace, etc. Yes. I believe we're about to hear about um, some controversy about how what shade of red the geraniums outside Buckingham Palace. Look <laughs> exactly. forward to hearing about that. <laughs> Lots of insider secrets going on there. Um, and Martin's going to be answering some listeners' questions. Uh, but first, let's catch up with Mark. So, Mark, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today. One of the things I always ask our guests is, how did they get into horticulture? And I know you've worked in horticulture for most of your working life. So how did it all start for you? Well, my my parents uh, lived, uh, were both actually in the forces uh, during war, but my father was in the Air Force and we lived on quarters uh, at an RAF station. And of course, every three years we found we were being moved somewhere else. Um, mother and father were both very, very keen gardeners. My father looking after the vegetables, the dahlia patch, I don't know if people still have them, and the roses. Um, my mother looking after the flower borders. And every time they moved, of course, they liked to create the garden they'd moved into in the style uh, that uh, that they were used to. So, of course, I always help, helped out in the garden. I was encouraged to do so, whether it was help cut the dahlias, pick the strawberries I loved doing. That was probably the, the most favourite of my jobs. So I always had a, I always had an interest uh, in, in gardening. And I do recall having seen something on social media very recently. Um, I went to a boarding school. So my first boarding school decided to have a gardening competition. So we all had a little plot. And I do remember winning the gardening um, cup one year. Uh, with uh, some uh, so, some fellow um, pupils there, and I notice on social media that they have set up their gardening club again, which was very very nice. Mm. So I uh, I I really didn't know what to do uh, with myself uh, as a career. I fancied being an RAF um, pilot, really, but of course in those days to fly. Uh, you needed science at O level, which I was never very good at. It's all done by computer now, but uh, I thought, well, let's let's try gardening. Let's give it let's give it a a, a go. So I volunteered um, um, uh, in my early twenties um, as a gardener on a market garden um, for the health authority. Health authorities in those days used to have big psychiatric hospitals, didn't they? With with acres mm. and acres grounds uh, and this one was um, in Wells in Somerset and I enjoyed it so much they were looking to recruit an extra gardener and um, and I got the job so I first started off by looking after the market garden and we grew loads of vegetables in those days um, it was all fresh fruit and vegetables down in the kitchens of the hospitals and I remember one of the first jobs that we did when we went in the morning seven o'clock in the morning uh, the head gardener used to go down to the kitchens and say, right, what do you need for lunch? And we used to be told either four boxes of leeks or we can have five baskets of <laughs> Savoy cabbage or runner beans, depending on the time of year. And we had to go and harvest those from, from our market garden and have them down at the kitchens by half past ten in the morning uh, in order for them to be prepared uh, for all of the lunches, not just for the patients, but in the staff canteen, the staff restaurant as well, which was actually waiter serviced and had uh, tablecloths on the tables. Quite different, I think, from hospital canteens these days. Um, so that was that was that was really really enjoyable. I enjoyed doing that. My first day, my first day of getting there, they gave me a small rotavator. And they said, right, we've got a three acre field that is full of cabbages. Um, you've got to rotivate up and down of the, the rows of cabbages. And I think it took me about two and a half, three days. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they allow me to go down with my, my, my sandwiches and my Coke can and not come up until uh, until I'd run out of petrol, I, I think. Is that what they call character building these days, Mark? <laughs> um, absolutely. But I always remember, do you know what, in those days, you know, we used to have really, really cold winters, which we don't now, do we? They, they last two or three days. And one of the worst things I recall was going out at eight o'clock in the morning in winter when they started asking for... Uh, boxes of Brussels sprouts 
and we had to pick the Brussels sprouts, which are frozen. It was like taking them out of a, a deep freeze off the stems and into the boxes. And your hands got so cold, you then put on gloves. And then when you put on the gloves, you couldn't actually take the Brussels sprouts off. So I remember that very, very vividly. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I then moved up because there was a very, very clear seniority route uh, working for the Health Authority. Um, and I then moved over to the grounds. And I say we used to have extensive grounds. And those psychiatric hospitals, not only did they have hundreds of patients, and it was home to some of the patients who were going to be there for a long time, uh, but also there were significant numbers of staff as well. So, you know, we had formal flower beds. You know, mm -hmm. it was gardens it was the garden of uh, of the of the residents uh, of the hospital but we used to have football pitch we had uh, cricket pitch we had grass tennis courts so there was a lot of grounds to look after in different ways uh, and i got to know about maintaining the sports pitches as well as maintaining you know different areas uh, 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 of public grounds but the most interesting one, I think, was the superintendent's own um, house and garden, which was within the estate. And the superintendents of the psychiatric hospitals in those days were very revered people in their own right. Mm. And, um, and of course, people like those that used to live in stately homes, people used to come and visit the, the superintendents and say, I've brought this plant back from abroad for you. It's, it's, it's quite rare. And those got planted in the garden. So I used to have to maintain uh, some shrubberies and borders with some quite unusual plants in, um, which actually helped me learn quite a lot uh, about the diversity uh, of plants that we, we use in this country. And then finally, I then got promoted to senior gardener, which meant I didn't have to work out in the cold anymore. I could work in a in a greenhouse propagating uh, plants, um, whether it's pot plants um, that we actually put around the, the, the wards, cut flowers that we used to do bouquets with uh, for people leaving or for, for vases in the hospital um, or whether it was propagating the bedding plants, you know, the geraniums and everything else that we used to plant out in the flower beds. Um, so, you know, the, the more senior you got, the comfier, I suppose, your job got as well. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I think I was there with the uh, with the health authority for 11 years. And at that point of time, we knew there was a change coming to the big psychiatric hospitals. So um, I started looking for other jobs and I put in for a few and um, some people wanted me and I thought I didn't want them and others I did want and they said no to me. And I saw this quite wonderful job actually for uh, the Royal Parks and it was for Greenwich Park in, in South East London where they wanted a propagator um, or nursery manager I suppose for the glass houses and I thought I've been doing quite a lot of propagating over recent years. Uh, let's go and uh, let's go and see uh, what the job's about. And cut a long story short, I was appointed, and that was back in 1989. I was appointed as uh, a propagator and nursery manager in Greenwich Park, one of the uh, the eight royal parks, which uh, was was a, a delight for me to be able to move to London uh, from uh, the depths of Somerset, but to be involved in such a prestigious organisation. And is that when you started working with Jim, Jim Buttress? I mean, some of our uh, listeners might have heard of Jim Buttress and we're going to get him on a podcast when I catch up with him at a show because Jim was uh, Greenwich for quite a while, I think, wasn't he, in Royal Parks? Uh, yes, yes, he was. And uh, of course, he was quite a figure in the local community because, of course, you know, the Royal Parks, they each have their, their, their band of stakeholders who all feel the park is theirs as well. So the job of a park manager is to appease the stakeholders and work with them. So indeed, Jim was my, 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 uh, my first park manager uh, when I came to the Royal Parks, and it was Jim who was on the interview panel and uh, interviewed me. Um, so uh, it was uh, it was uh, really really nice to be interviewed by someone who had so much respect in the local community, who had so much respect actually within all horticulture because Jim holds the Victoria Medal of Honour, doesn't mm -hmm. he? So that's yes, really nice. Yeah. And I've got to say, Jim and I have worked very closely with each other since, and uh, we're still great friends now. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a great chap, he's, he's Jimmy, really, really is a real character as well. Um, we're going to take a break in a couple of minutes, but you, you're still with the Royal Parks now. And am I right in thinking you are the park manager for St. James Park and the Green Park, which are essentially, for those that don't know, they're the parks to the front of Buckingham Palace, aren't they, in London? 
Yes, indeed they are. Um, very, very important. We have Buckingham Palace, Clarence House, St James's Palace in the park, Wellington Barracks, and then Horse Guards and Horse Guards Parade the other. So we're right in the centre of the parks. We have Hyde Park Corner on one end of us, and we have Trafalgar Square and Parliament Square at the other end. So uh, we're very much in the middle of it, with 17.7 million visitors a year. Wow. And how big an area is that you cover then with the Green Park and and uh, St. James? I mean, the, these are big parks, aren't they, in London? Well, in, in old in old money, it's only about 100 acres so for the two parks combined. So it's very small. And that's including things like pavements, the roads. We look after the Mall. We look after Horse Guards Parade Ground, Birdcage Walk, Constitution Hill. So in actual fact, we are the smallest of all the Royal Parks. And yet we have a significant number of mm. visitors come to us on an annual basis. Yes. So how do the Royal Parks differ from, you know, an ordinary council park? Are you still uh, financed by uh, sort of rates and people's council tax? How does it work? Is it, or is the Royal Parks very different? The, uh, the Royal Parks is very different. So the Royal Parks uh, are actual Crown lands, all owned, all owned by the Crown. And the Crown decided to... Um, uh, open the, their, their, their lands to the public to enjoy and so they were given to the to the government to administer um, so uh, we've always been an agency uh, re- reporting to a government department and those government departments have changed whether it's department of national heritage but more recently it's a department of culture media and sport so the royal parks manage the lands on, on behalf of government but the royal parks themselves have become a charity um, only a few years ago uh, that we felt it was time to see if we could break away from the government and give us a little bit more autonomy. Autonomy mainly in, in how we manage our budgets, um, because before it's like any sort of local authority. We weren't allowed to bank money. We weren't allowed to reserve it. You know, anything that was unspent from our budget given to us by, by government that was unspent at the end of the year, we had to give back. But now we can we can invest. Now we can uh, look to to carry projects over, um, and uh, it's it's been relatively new for us. It's been a massive massive change to become a, a charity, um, and at this time we're taking lot and lot more staff actually in house than we did before. So whereas before we used to have commercial operations in the parks, such as boating on the lakes, which was done by a private contractor. We are now managing all of that ourselves in-house with our own staff. And uh, I suppose um, the, the, the the most ambitious project we've done recently is a multi-million pound refurbishment of our glasshouse nurseries in Hyde Park, which is now managed by our own staff providing bedding plants, about 450,000 bedding plants a year uh, to all the Royal Parks. So uh, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's quite a significant change for us to become a charity and a very exciting one as well. Well, we'll find out more about that in just a few minutes time then, Mark. Well, it sounds like it's going to give them, well, it already is giving them all sorts of more powers being this charity and having autonomy. I love mm. the idea of bringing everything in house and going a little bit back to how it used to be. That sounds mm. great. Mm. Yeah, it is. I mean, the way Mark talks, and I see Mark at the flower shows, because what he didn't mention is he also judges at the RHS flower shows as well. And, you know, the Royal Parks are run like parks departments were run when I was an apprentice, sort of 40 odd years ago. They're very traditional in that respect, which is great. It keeps the the, the work going and the skills there with all the staff. Mm. Mm. But 17 point, what was it, 17.7 million visitors in a year? That's incredible, That's, isn't it? That is mad. And hundreds of thousands of bedding plants. And, and yeah. in the next part, when we go back to Mark, he's going to tell us a bit more about the royal part of Royal Parks, isn't he? You were exactly. you so oh. excited. He's yes. such a royalist. Exactly. So, yes, we'll be hearing stories <laughs> from the Queen and, uh, and, and the new king, uh, <laughs> formerly Prince Charles. Mm. Fabulous. And um, just to remind everybody who's listening, if you want to ask a question to Martin, drop us an email, info at potsandtrials.com, info at potsandtrials.com. Or if you're listening slash watching this on YouTube, then just put a comment on the video, put a comment on any of our videos and we'll try and answer it on the podcast, won't we? Mm-hmm. Oh, of course we will. Have we got some now? us neatly to some questions. <laughs> Obviously, uh, nothing's done by accident in this podcast. <laughs> Um, are you ready? Are you ready for some questions? I'm there? ready. I'm ready to go. <laughs> ready. Always ready. OK, this one's from Maureen. Um, I was given a small pot of roses with flowers at Christmas from a local supermarket. It looks like four rose cuttings. 
The flowers have now died. Will these cuttings grow outside? Good question, Maureen. Um, I mean, roses are hardy and what they tend to use on these little pots are often, um, I mean, they're mass produced in nurseries abroad to get them in flower at this time of the year. But they're often miniature roses they put in pots. And it is, as you say, just cuttings that are stuck in, grown in perfect conditions and they bring them to flower. If you plant them outside, um, they will grow, um, but they are going to be a small rose. And these are varieties that are bred for pot culture or for fast growing. So, but yeah, if you want to keep them, have a go. It's worth it. Either pot them into a bigger pot and use them as a patio plant or put them into the garden and see what happens. And let us know. We'd like to know how they do. Yeah, yeah, it's good to keep us updated on those things, isn't it? And we've also got a question from Andrea um, with regards to one of our latest Pots and Trowels videos on tidying up our herbaceous border. Uh, and she noticed that you put a mulch down. Uh, can you just give her the details of the mulch? Andrea, you weren't paying attention <laughs> because on the video I did name this mulch. Um, but I will oh, do I it do. again for benefit of people listening to us on this. Um, yeah, it's a lovely mulch. Uh, we got it from a company in Norfolk. It's called Plant Grow and it's their mulch and, and soil condition conditioner and it's basically composted uh, rye grass and maize that they grow on their farm and then they use that in uh, in biodigesters to make electricity and this is the, the byproduct essentially mm. and it's a really good soil conditioner and mulch so don't you think you can buy it from garden centres you have to buy it I direct I think in you bulk? would need to go direct to them and it comes in bulk yeah. bags but they're called plank grow just it you'll find nice. them on the internet mm. yes it's mm, lovely to work stuff. with Excellent stuff. And actually, that's it's worth just mentioning there. We have a video every week on a Thursday. So if you've come upon the podcast without noticing the videos first, um, YouTube's your best bet for this. Pots and Trowels, links are in the show notes. But every Thursday, there's an advice video. Or uh, sometimes we get to peek over the garden hedge into a, a garden you don't get to mm. see very often or talk to some um, growers who are experts in specific fields, don't we? We do. We do. And a while ago, this is going back some time, we did one on taking black currant cuttings and there's a question popped up uh, on that one. Um, just to say, do you uh, do you water the cuttings in the soil? No, I wouldn't do it. If you're, if normally when you take them in the autumn or through the winter is what we call a hardwood cutting, which is sort of like a pencil length and a piece of woody stem, and we put them directly into the ground, then if they're outside, you wouldn't need to water them unless it's very dry. Mm. But if you're in the UK, certainly not, because we've had one of the wettest winters. If you're doing them in pots in a cold frame, then yes, but outside, no, let them root and they'll start to grow any time now. Superb, excellent stuff. Well, I think it's time to come and find out all that wonderful royal gossip. Is it gossip? <laughs> well, not gossip, but info about the royals. From exactly. Yeah. Information, vital. <laughs> so, Mark, you were in Greenwich Park. So how did you come to be at St. James Park? <laughs> well, uh, Greenwich Park was lovely being a propagator. And of course, in those days, uh, the Royal Park's apprentices used to put on a display uh, every year in the uh, large marquee at Chelsea Flower Show. And uh, I suddenly found out I was propagating and growing on some of the plants that were going to be used in our Chelsea displays um, under the capable hands of Jim Butler, who we, who we mentioned earlier. And we were also heavily involved in the National Garden Festivals as well. And uh, one of the first jobs I had to do was start sending plants up to Gateshead, uh, where the Royal Parks had the, had the winning garden. Um, so it was a lovely time uh, growing all the bedding plants for Greenwich Park and for the National Maritime Museum and for the Royal Naval College uh, in Greenwich, uh, which we used to look after at the time. But I'd only been there a couple of years and it was suddenly decided that, look, you know, the Government at the time felt it was very, very important to give private industry uh, opportunities. And so you will have heard of compulsory competitive tendering. Um, mm. um, and it was felt that um, just to show that quite well run organisations could run just as easily with private contractors coming in, they decided that Royal Parks would be, and I say privatised, but put out to to, pri to con private contractors. So we were all given our cards and I thought, well, that's good. I've been here for two years, this lovely job in London, and suddenly I'm being told uh, you haven't got a job anymore. Um, so Jim Buttress came to me and he'd very kindly sent me off to college to do um, at the NEBS, which was the super supervisory management diploma. 
And um, uh, Jim said to me, Mark, I don't know what your plans are, but they're looking for supervisors to look after these contractors that are coming to the park. He said, and I think they've got a job growing in Hyde Park if, if you're interested. So I put in for the job in Hyde Park and went down to uh, uh, civil service um, um, personnel or HR headquarters, as we call them now. And I got interviewed by the uh, the acting bailiff and by the uh, um, ch new chief executive of the Royal Parks, David Welsh. And I got a phone call a couple of days later, said, Mark, thank you for coming, but we're very sorry. We're not able to uh, to give you Hyde Park. We've got uh, that role for someone else. But if you're interested, um, we can offer you the post in St. James's Park. Would you like it? And I said, oh, yes, please. Mm, not uh, bad. And immediately went back. And don't forget, I was new to London. I went back into the greenhouse and talked to this. I said, where's St. James's Park then? I hadn't a clue where, where it was, but I was going to send it down. Anyway, so uh, within a few months, I was here in St. James's Park. The first day I walked around it, uh, um, there, I, I walked around it in about 15, 20 minutes. And I thought, what a small park. What on earth do they need a park manager for this place for? Little was I to know what was, <laughs> what mm. was to follow. Um, but yes, so I was here at the outset of, uh, uh, of contracting and of course, you know, everything was priced in advance. So every single um, piece of grass, every single footpath, every single flower bed has got a plot number, which I personally have, have allocated to them. And of course, we had a whole suite of job specifications. So was it grass that needed to be cut with a, a cylinder mower with a box? Was it uh, grass that we were going to cut with a rotary mower without a box? All of that. I allocated a regime to every single plot that I created throughout St. James's Park and Green Park. It was a fascinating exercise, uh, but it taught me a whole new way uh, of management of parks, you know, with contractors coming in. Um, so uh, I was here as park supervisor, I think my, my title was in those days, looking after the flower beds and, and, and managing the contractors. And it must be an amazing job because I suppose of all the royal parks, the ones that get so much footfall and are seen on television and people that are going to see Buckingham Palace, they've got to walk through one of your parks to get there. So, you know, just to think that you're responsible for that must make you very, very proud. And, and I suppose within your job that you do you have any royal involvement i mean do the royals have any involvement with the parks or how things happen in the park because we all know that some of the royals are keen gardeners um in actual fact uh, king charles um is our patron now because we have become a charity but yes we know that all members of the royal family take some sort of interest now, we sometimes get told off because in front of Buckingham Palace, uh, it is tradition that the flower, flowers are red geraniums in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that was the directive of King George V in 1935. And we think the red geraniums were chosen because they had to match the guardsmen's tunics in Buckingham ah. Palace. Um, and that's what we've always been told. And a few years after... I started back at St. James's Park as manager. One of the previous managers came back for a visit and I asked him the question and he said, Mark, that's absolutely right. He said, in those days, I think we used to use Gustav Emick uh, geraniums, the lovely, lovely deep red head. He said, so it was tradition that at the beginning of the year, one of us would go up to the nursery in Hyde Park and take some of the Gustav Emick heads off, flower heads off, tie them up in raffia and they will get sent into the palace um, for the queen to have a look at and we would get either the nod or a shake of the head but of course it was always a nod to say yes they're fine go ahead so it makes you think that someone very very senior in the palace was approving the flower beds now over the years we lost our stock or, or, of uh, Gustav Emic or, or they weren't as good. And we felt it was easier to go for seed grown geraniums. And we were getting them from, you know, the big uh, bedding plants of our suppliers. I won't say which which one, but they decided to change their range of uh, geraniums one year. So we put in the geranium. We planted the geranium this summer that uh, they gave us. And sure enough, I got a phone call during the course of the summer 
Mark, are you sure you've planted <laughs> you've planted the correct geranium this year? So someone someone has 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 been looking. So yes, they they do take an interest. And um, for um, I normally go into Buckingham Palace. I love to say I go into Buckingham Palace quite often, uh, but uh, I do go in quite often just to update them on things that are happening in the park because mm. James's Park is effectively the front garden. And I was told once we were doing something down on the corner of St. James's Park, close to Buckingham Palace. And they told me, Mark, um, we're going to let the Queen know about this one because I think uh, she'll be very interested. And they said she, they're very interested in everything you do. And we do very much appreciate you coming up with all these, these updates. So, uh, yes, um, it's very nice to know that we do have uh, that support from the royal family. But I also know that um, I might be told off if I don't quite do it right. <laughs> well, it's, it's good to know that they're watching from the balcony. They're looking there <laughs> to make sure you're planting them and mowing the grass right. Uh, and, and I know because um, the king uh, lives uh, in Clarence House, or did do, I don't know that he still d does, but when yes, he was a prince of Wales. And of course, the park backs onto him. So he can see everything that's happening in Green Park, can't he, really? Um, yeah, well, yes, he does. So um, as part of the Coronation Meadow pro project, um, uh, when Her Late Majesty was still alive, they decided that the last, the charity decided the last meadow of the Coronation project would be planted somewhere in London. And we bid for it, um, not just because if there was a coronation, it would happen here. But we said, look, we need the opportunity. There are some some children and some youngsters uh, in London that don't get the chance to go out to the country and see the wonderful meadows, the flowers, the nature, mm -hmm. the insects. And I said, we're bringing it to them if we if we put it in into Green Park. And the charity said, that's a wonderful idea. Um, yes, we're happy to plant this meadow for you in Green Park. When Prince Charles, as he was then, heard about it. He was absolutely delighted. He said, right, I am going to help come and sow at the meadow. And sure enough, uh, when the meadow was sown, uh, Prince Charles was there. And he said, I want some children to plant the meadow because he's very, very keen, you know, on getting young people involved in horticulture. Um, he said, um, I'm going to help sow the meadow with, with the children. And that's exactly what happened in, in Green Park. Uh, and we had a nice little... Um, uh, we had a nice gathering up there and uh, the Rare Breed Society were up there and Plant Life were up there as well. And um, uh, and Deb's good enough, who was the, uh, the, 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 the Prince Charles Gardener at Highgrove, um, came up to me and said, Mark, you make sure you do this right, because he will walk out from Clarence House with a torch <laughs> at night just to check on its progress. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, it's, as I say, they, they really do take a, 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 an interest. And I could mention uh, other stories as well, but uh, I don't want to go on too much. But we, uh, We'll have to do a part two. It's, yes, <laughs> absolutely. No, I mean, it's fascinating to, to think that you're doing that work uh, and it's being seen by millions of people, not only the royals, as you say, it's almost like their front garden, but millions of people see the parks that you're responsible for. And I know you've got a team of very dedicated workers, but you must take great pride from that. Am I right in thinking also um, you manage the floral tributes uh, in the park for the funeral of the late Queen? Uh, yes, in yes, indeed. So the, the mall leads from um, Trafalgar Square, Admiralty Arch down to Buckingham Palace. People keep commenting on it. They said, why is the road red? Um, well, it was laid out by Aston Webb, you know, when he laid out the front of Buckingham Palace with a wonderful memorial to uh, Queen Victoria and Admiralty Arch. It was known as processional route. And of course, the Mall is a processional route. If we have funerals, if we have weddings, if we have uh, events of state, that is where the procession will take place. So we say that the Mall is the red carpet leading right mm -hmm. up to, 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 to Buckingham Palace. So, of course, we get heavily involved in all of the, the major events. Um, and we need to prepare the park. We need to prepare the mall. Um, whenever we have a big ceremonial event, traffic lights are taken out. So, you know, that is something I have to arrange. And people say to me, why don't you take the traffic lights out? Well, you can't have that lovely procession down the mall if there's obstacles in the way. Um, so, you know, we have uh, one or two of us ha have 
have had all of the details of any major event that's going to happen. And it's no secret now that uh, there was a plan called London Bridge for the Queen's funeral, um, which uh, I uh, had a, a copy in my possession for 20 years, and it was regularly updated so that when that day came, when the moment came, and none of us knew until the sad day that the Queen had died that you know the plan was going to be invoked, mm. I immediately knew what I had to do. And one of those responsibilities for us was within 24 hours to have a floral tribute area arranged somewhere it had to be some distance from buckingham palace it had to be some distance for the ceremonial route not just so that it didn't interfere with the uh, procession but for security reasons as well so a couple of years beforehand i and a colleague we found this little area this little grove should i say in the green park that we thought would be absolutely ideal and we'd shared our plans with the media and said look it's going to be very very important that rather than people laying their flowers in front of Buckingham Palace, that they actually come to Green Park and lay them here. So we are going to need you to support us and put the messages out so that, you know, we, we can do that. And uh, and uh, that's what we, we had to do. So um, uh, anything that was laid in the palace overnight on, on the first night of, uh, uh, of, of the Queen's death, we then moved to Green Park. And it was decided that we would take off the cellophane. Um, now, that was for twofold. Um, we always said to be sustainable, we would like to compost the flowers afterwards mm -hmm. and reuse them in the royal parks, you know, as a gesture of remembrance to the Queen. So we would need to take the, the cellophane off anyway. And the police were also very worried about anything that might be hidden within them. So I remember as at one meeting with the, the household, um, cabinet office, DCMS and the military, and we were talking about how the, 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 the floral tribute area would work. And I suggested that we would cut all of the, the cellophane off. And they looked at me and they said, are you being serious? And I said, uh, well, yes, I am. And, you know, we will have staff there with trestle tables to help people. And uh, that's, that's what we would do. And it was agreed that we would do. Now, um, we hadn't realised, I suppose, quite how many tributes would come so soon. And we were, we were aiming that we would just let people put the tributes on the ground. But on that first day, um, people were coming in and they were putting down their flowers quite artistically. And we thought we will leave the public to do that. Um, a lot of the flowers initially still had cellophane on. Those that we'd moved overnight from the palace had cellophane on. So we started using volunteers and staff to cut the cellophane off. On about day two or three, I managed to get out of the office for half an hour and go and give a hand. And I remember two ladies were, plant, were, were, were laying flowers and they asked me what I was doing. And I was explaining what, why we were taking the, the cellophane off. And it was easier to, to see the flowers, to appreciate them more. And they said, would you like a hand? So I gave them some scissors and these two ladies were helping me. After half an hour, it was 17 people helping. I then came back to the office and at lunchtime, I got a phone call from one of my colleagues. I said, Mark, there's 100 people up there now taking cellophane off all of the flowers. Wow. And what a wonderful thing to do, because the one thing that people said afterwards, um, coming to, to, to visit the floral tribute area was the smell. Not only could they see the flowers and the course of Paddington Bears, but the smell. So I think that was the nicest thing that we've done. Yeah. And I think by the end of the period of mourning, we had in the region of 150,000 uh, floral tributes laid with many more, um, hundreds of thousands coming to visit. On some days, the, the, it, the park was so busy, we had to close the Green Park and uh, our colleagues in Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens had opened up alternative floral tribute areas there as well. Uh, you know, it was one of the most poignant, I think, and uh, memorable uh, experiences and projects I've, I, I've been involved in. And, you know, so pleased that it, it went so well as well. Brilliant. You've had a fantastic career and it must have been such an honour to be involved in in that type of thing, Mark. Thank you for sparing the time to talk to us. We will catch up with you again because I'm sure you've got lots more stories that you can tell us. So, Mark, thank you for joining us.
it's great to hear these insider stories, isn't it? Because, you know, things like getting ready for parades in in, uh, in the Mall, taking all the traffic lights out. I didn't, you just no, don't notice them, no. do you? But if they were it's there, just, yeah. you would notice them. But then the funeral flowers, what a lovely story. I mean, that's Amazing, a fantastic yeah. thing to do, isn't it? And I'm sure the Queen would have really appreciated something like that happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all the, t- you know, removing the cellophane, but getting volunteers just coming and yes, helping because you would wouldn't you go well i can do some of that yeah. you know you'd yeah. feel you were helping wouldn't yes. you? Mm. yes yes oh. yeah and, and it's part of everybody feeling that they're doing something together as well just to share that grief at the, the loss and then mm. yeah, and then lots. using those flowers for the for the compost for yeah. the, was for the parts wasn't it and yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what they did exactly they were all composted and it would have been a big heap of compost and then that's been used as a mulch on the bed mm. so yeah no it's all put to good use what we need to do i need to support, speak to mark again at a show and get in with jim buttress because jim has also <laughs> got some amazing stories because jim was royal parks he, he's got lots of stories of the queen when she was younger in the gardens at buckingham palace mm. and also the late queen mother at clarence house and he used to sit and have a gin and tonic with her so we need to get jim on to yeah do that yeah, one. yeah. Ooh, the other thing you need to ask mark about is composting of the Royal Parks, you know, do they have this huge compound for composting? Well, they must do. I, th- I think we can have a whole series of Royal Parks podcasts. <laughs> well, not not to cast dispersions on the idea of composting the flowers, but you'd need to mix that with something else as well, wouldn't you? Just yeah. to give a bit of. I don't know. Mm, probably not, because there'd be a whole, there'd be soft growth, woody growth. They'll put it through mm. a chipper. Uh, so now I think that would make mm. really good compost. Mm. Mm, but fantastic. they must produce an awful lot. The other thing you need to ask about is slugs, Martin. <laughs> Well, I, I, you, you can ask me. Well, that, that would be my little tip this week, because I know we are running out of time. Um, slugs are already out there. You know, some people say start to start controlling slugs on Valentine's Day, the 14th of February. Um, they are out there. We've had very wet conditions, which slugs and snails like. And if the ground starts to warm up, they'll become active. And I've noticed a few slugs out in the garden but I've actually noticed them in the greenhouse which is quite scary because we sowed our aubergines a couple of weeks ago and peppers the seed that we got from king seed they're doing really well but I've noticed only this morning I've checked them and two of the seedlings have been nibbled off just nibbled off um, which is a slug and there's a bit of a slug trail in the propagator in the greenhouse so How as soon as we finish there? I never get no. it how do they get through such exactly. tiny gaps so I don't all know. over the place aren't they you know people have them in the house and everywhere don't mm. they but i shall be in there when we finish recording this podcast and i'll be out there <laughs> lifting all the pots and trays searching for them and disposing so if you are sowing seedlings just be aware that slugs will have a nibble Hmm. Yeah. On a yeah. podcast a couple of weeks ago, we talked about making a garlic solution, didn't we, for the slugs? Could you use that on those seedlings? I might have to do. I might, okay. have to I might get cooking to, this afternoon. I then. might have to sit in there at night with my head torch. Yeah. As well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Slug hunter is extraordinaire. Um, just to remind everyone, if you've got a question for Martin, we answer. Well, we try to answer them every week. So yeah, drop us an email info at potsandtrowels.com. Um, yeah. Is that about it for this week? It is. Yeah. It? Next week we're going to be talking to a lady called Karen Jimson, and she is a writer, a broadcaster, gardener, cut flower grower. So we're going to find out all about what she's up to. Brilliant. Look forward to it. See you next week. Bye. <laughs> Watch the videos on YouTube or Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter or X and subscribe to the podcast and never miss a thing. For more information, go to potsandtrials.com.